Well, my name is um, Matthew McBride and I work in Dr. Bradley's lab and undergraduate at Drexel University. And today I'm going to be discussing a few things. Um, mainly one of the main goals that I'll be discussing today is the advantage of that I've received using Open Notebook Science as an undergraduate student. Um, and then some of the different things I've been able to learn from that and some of the tools I've been able to use through that. But um, there's really been three main um, advantages that I've found and have benefited from from using the Open Notebook Science um, in Dr. Bradley's lab. One of the primary ones is um, just organization skills and learning how to properly present experiments. Um, as an undergraduate coming into the lab, that's, that's new. That, that is new, having to um, organize my thoughts in a scientific and coherent manner and, um, and this presenting an experiment in a way that someone else could read it and actually understand what I did. Um, another way that is really helpful is receiving timely feedback and corrective input. That wouldn't necessarily be um, possible if there wasn't a central location where we could each access the material. Um, and also then there's also documentation of my contribution to a project. So rather than just being scrap paper of my calculations or different things, there's location where there is different, um, a place where people can view what work I have done. So I'm just going to outline each of those a little bit more. Um, one of the things that I have to do when I perform an experiment in the lab is I, within 24 or by the end of the, that day, I need to update the experiment log. Um, that seems relatively straightforward, but I'm an undergraduate. I get kind of lazy sometimes. So probably and there's many of my other undergraduates are the same way. But um, so that having to update it by the end of the day is extremely valuable because it forces me, A, to keep detailed notes on um, what I've done. Because if I sit down while I'm in the lab after doing an experiment and go, wait, what was the name of that chemical again? And I have it right there and I can go check. I'm not back at my dorm room going, I don't have it in front of me. I don't have Dr. Bradley around to ask. So forcing me to update the log immediately is make sure that I'm doing it when it's fresh in my mind. Um, and also, it, it makes me notice detail. Because um, that was one of the first things. That first time I tried to write a log, you, I would write something, and then if I tried to go back and read it later, could I even understand what I did? So it really forces me, it forced me very early on to keep a close um, an eye on detail to make sure that I was aware of what I was doing in lab and how little details um, matter. Um, it also eliminates a long-term reliance on handwritten notes, which is very important. I take in a lot of classes. As an undergraduate, we have notebooks all over the place. Um, the sooner that information can get out of the paper of the notebook and into an electronic format that can be is a permanent record, the better. So being forced to update that log is very good for keeping um, track of the research I've done as an undergraduate. Um, one of the other things is identifying the purpose of the experiments I've run. Um, in addition to the log, I also have to complete a full, um, basically, experiment entry. And obviously that would require my name, but also an objective. So let's say I followed a procedure to synthesize a compound. Well, why? So was I just following the steps one after another, or did I actually know why I was doing it? It forces me to identify which, for many people who have been doing chemistry for years, that's really easy. For the first couple of times, that was actually more difficult. Like, to actually step back and go, well, why was I doing this? Was I just following instruction because that's what I was told to do? Or did I actually, it forced me to understand why I was performing the experiment, which was really valuable. Um, it, I had to list the procedure. And now this was separate from the log, because the log was extremely detailed and time-stamped, where the procedure was more of a general explanation. Could I just break down in a general manner the experiment I had just run? And that was an extremely valuable um, ability to gain. Then I would be able to have to list results and be able to link to the different spectrums and different things um, and be able to list what results did I obtain. And then a discussion, which for me, the discussion was probably the hardest. Um, to, and I don't even, I'm still getting better at it. Um, but to maybe, to basically to understand, so I have my results, what do they mean? Like, because it's really easy for me to look at, oh, the melting point was 110, but the literature melting point's 150. Ah, no big deal, who cares? Well, that, that means something. There's, there's obviously, either there's an impurity, there's something. What happened? Why is it? Um, and it really forced me to be able to explain the results and think about it in a critical manner, which was extremely valuable, and then obviously draw a conclusion from that, which if I couldn't draw a conclusion from the results, then I really didn't gain as much through it. So that's more the organizational and being able to present myself in a scientific manner 
that open notebook science and having this um, lab notebook that I have to update was really valuable for me as an undergraduate. <clears throat> also, one of the other huge parts is the input. Having that electron, having that notebook, and because we use actually Wikispaces, um, so Dr. Bradley could go through my notebook and he make make comments. For example, let's I as you can see here in the experiment, I had a result and I was using the spectrum was not set up correctly. So he was able to flag that, but then tell me that he he corrected it. Whereas if I had just gotten the file from the um, from downstairs using the NMR machine and gave it to Dr. Bradley and then he processed it. I never would have known if I made a mistake in the processing it. So this is a way where I was notified of a mistake I made, and so I'm aware of it and can learn from that and attempt not to create that same mistake again. Um, so it was really helpful for receiving timely input to knowing um, what errors I made and how to correct them. And, and I have a permanent record of the comments Dr. Bradley gave me. They're not, it wasn't just a, um, like in the lab, oh, by the way, this needs to be done differently, but I have it actually something to go back and refer to for later if I don't remember exactly um, where I made the mistake. And then finally, I guess one of the um, important advantages for this is also documentation. Um, there's going to be seasons where I'll be able to work in the lab more and seasons where I can work in the lab less while I'm um, an undergraduate. And it'll, but it, when I go on to apply for like grad school or different things, there'll be that permanent record that people can click and actually see what work did I do. Because it looks great, like let's say I put on an application, I know how to use NMR. Okay, does that mean I ran one sample with two other grad students around and just sat there in the corner and didn't pay any attention? No, or they could actually look at my list of experiments and see, oh wow, he ran NMR about six times every day that one summer, because there were times I was running NMR six times every day this summer. But, um, and actually see, I was able to analyze the data and understand it. Well, some, most of the time I understand it. Um, but so that was one of the other advantages that I really find helpful. But, um, so now I'm actually going to go into the solubility. Um, I know Dr. Bradley referenced this a little bit for the recrystallization. But I'm going to go into how I used some of the Open Notebook Science tools to um, use the solubility and the, how it relates to the recrystallization app that, um, that our lab has been using. Um, basically, for that recrystallization app, you really need accurate solubility predictions. Because um, if you don't have an accurate solubility at room temperature for a compound in the different organic solvents, then the recrystalliz predicted recrystallization yield is not going to be as useful. So there's certain preferred solvent characteristics, and um, obviously you don't want the, the solvent to react with the compound you're attempting to recrystallize, because that kind of defeats the purpose. Um, especially if you're doing it as a means of purification. Um, you want high solubility at boiling point, but a low solubility at room temperature, so that you're not, because if you have a high solubility at room temperature, obviously you could be losing a significant amount of your product. Um, and then obviously you want the product to be easy to dry, and miscibility with water is preferred, as it because water can be one of the biggest impurities when attempting to purify a compound. So basically, uh, one of the ways that we predict solubility is using the Abraham descriptors. Um, I'm just going to briefly kind of go through how the Abraham descriptors work. Basically, for every sol solute and every solvent, you have five descriptors. Um, and now the dis this Abraham descriptors for over 80 solvents are, are, are known, are well known. And that also includes ethanol water mixtures, which is important too because that's, they're commonly used um, in pharmaceutical for drug delivery at times. So that's why knowing the solubility, if you have, if let's say it, you're, you just synthesized a new compound that you're interested in potentially as some sort of drug, to be able to quickly get a prediction, well, how soluble would this be in a certain ethanol water mixture would be extremely valuable. Um, but then basically the descriptors for a solute can be experimentally determined by measuring the solubility in five solvents. So let's say I have a compound and I want to get the Abraham descriptors. If I take the experimental solubility and get it in five different solvents, I can get those Abraham descriptors, so I'll get a predicted solubility in, over, in those over 80 other solvents. But now just recently, um, that as Dr. Bradley referenced, that Dr. Lang has developed is this uh, Model 3, has shown the ability to pr accurately predict Abraham descriptors without any experimental measurements. So that's showing um, some definite um, promise for that you would not have to per perform any experiments to get predicted solubility. But then once these solute descriptors are determined or predicted, 
you can then match them with the solvents with known descriptors and get a predicted solubility. So with these solubility predictions, you could enter a compound such as transdibenzylacetone. This is actually a compound I've been working with a great deal this past summer. And I'll get into, in a few slides, I'll talk about a little bit more why I focused on this compound. But um, so using actually the ONS web services, you could plug in the compound using the chem ChemSpider ID is one of the main ways that we identify compounds, and you would get, a, you would get the list of predictions. Um, I just threw on a slide here of a couple of them. You have like isopropyl, ethanol, methanol. You could get the Model 3 predicted solubility, which is no experiments done. The, measured soli the Abraham descriptive measured solubility, which is just from five, um, five solubilities measured not necessarily in those solvents. And then the actual experimental solubility, which is what this summer I was doing was actually measuring the solubility to see how it compared to some of the predictions. Um, but actually, if you also, one of the great advantages is, if you notice, there's a thermometer next to the boiling point, a little red thermometer. Um, if you click on that, it takes you to a temperature-dependent solubility curve. So basically, how this works is it uses, a, using the melting point, it basically assumes that at the melting point of the compound, it's assuming that the compound will be miscible with the solvent. And then with that and with the solubility at room temperature, it generates this temperature-dependent solubility curve. And so far, based on what experiments we've run, this curve has turned out to be pretty accurate. Um, but it's really valuable because you can start to look at what's the difference in solubility between boiling point, room temperature, boiling point, freezing point. And so you can start to see if there's any differences in solubility. Um, but one of the ways is you need that accurate solubility um, at room temperature. So one of the things is measuring solubility has actually turned out to be relatively difficult. It, I mean, it seems relatively straightforward, and there's t plenty of literature on measuring solubility. But actually, here's a slide that just um, <clears throat> from a paper that examines some experimental solubilities that they did versus the reported ones in literature. And as, I mean, if you look at the um, top one, you have they experimentally measured it in 1.09 millimolar, but in literature it ranged from 0.05 to 1.6. So you have a little bit of a range there. But then if you were to look at, if you look at the third one, you have a, a experimental solubility of 1.26, and in literature it was reported as 0.1. So there's obviously a disconnect between what was reported in literature, whether that was done under different conditions, which as Dr. Bradley referred to earlier, if there was an open lab notebook to be able to examine how their experiment was run, you could determine how those, what, what they might have done differently that could have caused that result, or whether it was just an inaccurate measurement. Um, so actually one of the ways that we developed in our lab um, to measure solubility is what we call, or what's known as the temperature controlled shake flask method. So basically what we would do is we place the solvent and the solute in a small um, screw cap one dram vial and we attach it to this metal rod, as you can see here. And basically that rod goes on the vortex into a water bath that, is at, that you can set at any temperature you please. So naturally, we were interested in the room temperature, so we set it to 25C. But in, you could examine solubility at other temperatures as well. And so that what this allows is this prevents a supersaturated um, solution, because that's one of the um, real hassles, is if you were to if you just leave it at room temperature or allow it to shake on the vortex, because if you were to just to shake it on top of the vortex, what we found was that the heat from the vortex itself um, and the mechanical shaking would actually increase the temperature. Because when I would come into the lab, I would take it off and measure the temperature first thing in the morning, and it could be at 35C, when lab temperature was only at 25C. So it was increasing the temperature, and that's why you needed that water bath to keep it at a steady temperature in order to get accurate measurements. And one of the other things when measuring solubility is you really need two consecutive measurements to determine that a solution really is saturated. Um, because different, some solutes and some solvents will go in within 30 seconds. Others could take a long period of time. Um, so one of the, how we measure solubility is using um, NMR, HNMR. Um, and basically, you have to take two consecutive measurements. So for example, I might, in this example here, I measured solubility in methanol, and I let it shake for 48 hours, took the measurement, 
and then let it shake for another 24 hours and took the measurement. And as you can see, it was only off, it was only different by 0 0.005, and that's that's within the error. So that um, <clears throat> solubility was the same. And so you go after so at the additional 24 hours of shaking did not increase this the solubility, so you could determine that, that solution was at saturation. Um, using the NMR, we basically we use the Google Apps scripts that um, were, we talked about earlier, and basically it identifies the you identify the the peaks for in this case the solvent is THF. You identify the peaks for our compound, and basically you compare the integration in order to determine what the molar concentration would be. For this, this is an example of a 1.5 molar saturated solution of dibenzyl acetone and THF. So that was basically how we measured solubility, but now what are some of the benefits of these solubility curves, these temperature dependent solubility curves that we were able to generate? Um, basically what this does is the, those temperature dependent solubility curves are the basis for the recrystallization app that um, Dr. Bradley talked about earlier because it allows the difference between solubility at boiling and solubility at room temperature to be examined. And what this does is this actually reduces the reliance on only recrystallizing in solvents that are listed in literature. Because up to this point, if you had a compound, you would just check what have people recrystallized this in before. Or if this was a new compound, what if people recrystallized similar compounds in before? You didn't, there weren't too many ways to just plug it in and see if there was any, what solvent would work best. Um, so this kind of optimizes or improves or gives more options to choosing a recrystallization solvent. Um, so here's actually an example, and this is where the trans dibenzyl acetone begins to tie in, um, is this is a really common compound in organic teaching labs. Actually, I had it um, spring quarter. One of our um, one of the organic teaching labs I was in was I had to synthesize this compound and recrystallize because um, it really demonstrates the allyl condensation relatively well. But um, what this oops, this dibenzyl acetone in my manual they had you recrystallize from ethyl acetate, and this compound was actually first recrystallized in ethyl acetate in 1906. There is a reported paper actually there were papers in German of this compound being recrystallized in ethyl acetate. And then in the organic synthesis procedure, they also recrystallize this compound in ethyl acetate. So then you begin going through, and you can do a Google search, and you'll find a list of um, organic teaching lab manuals that all recrystallize from ethyl acetate. So they're all using the same solvent that was first used in 1906. Um, but you have to ask the question, is that the best solvent? Because ethyl acetate isn't miscible with water. So if there is any um, impurity it, or if there's any um, water in your sample, that could cause a problem. And I'll tell you from my own personal experience in the organic teaching lab, I, usually when I did the synthesis or when we were examining it, it our compounds were very wet. Um, um, so that was something that could have been beneficial. So that's when you begin into the app, which I'm not going to completely go over that because Dr. Bradley um, discussed that already. But So you plug in the dibenzyl acetone um, into the app and identify the different parameters. Now, one of the other things that I would like to just mention that as an undergraduate student, I actually didn't fully understand like recrystallization and the different properties um, until I actually was forced to consider the different parameters for this app. Because in, in lab, we, got, we had our manual, and it said recrystallize from ethyl acetate. So I wanted to get an A in the lab, so I recrystallized an ethyl acetate, didn't think twice about it. Well, so you get these parameters and go, well, why do I care what the boiling point is? Well, it's obvious because if the boiling point is too high, you're never going to be able to remove the compound or dry it. Um, and how does the end, end point temperature make any difference? Well, it's all temperature dependent. So really actually using this and Using an app like this, even in a lab, a teaching lab setting, would be really beneficial to, as a student, understanding how a solvent is picked and what certain characteristics are most valuable. But once again, you go in, um, fill in the different characteristics, and you get your list of predictions. Now, immediately what you notice is that ethanol comes out at, as a predicted recrystallization yield of 91%. While ethyl acetate, the one that everyone has seemed to have been using, is down at 69%. And these, this prediction is generated from the temperature dependent solubility curves, which when you look at those curves, you can really begin to see why. Um, ethyl acetate, which is the top graph, has a, has a solubility at 0.62 molar at room temperature. 
while ethanol has a solubility of 0.09 mole at room temperature. And when that's taken into consideration with the difference at boiling point, you can see that ethanol and its miscibility with water would make a better um, solvent to recrystallize from than ethyl acetate. <clears throat> Additionally, there's another characteristic that needs to be considered, and that is the solubility at boiling. Because if the solubility at boiling is too low, it's going to make an impractical um, recrystallization solvent. And one of the examples that we ran into with this was with hexane, dibenzyl acetone. Um, the other slide showed that hexane actually had a predicted recrystallization yield of 90%. But the problem is, at boiling, hexane only has a solubility of 0.3 molar. So that means to recrystallize one gram of the dibenzyl acetone, you would have to use 13 milliliters of the hexane, which isn't horrible, but if you could pick a solvent that only required three or four milliliters, that would be much more optimal. And because if you had a large amount of product to recrystallize, that would start to get into a higher amount of that solvent. But that's just another characteristic that needs to be considered. So that's the recrystallization aspect. But you can actually use these solubility tools to plan a synthesis or a reaction. Um, because basically, ideally, when you're performing a reaction, you want the solubility to, you want the reactants to be soluble and the product to not be soluble so that you can just filter and recover your product. And this is what I'm going to get into the, um, the compound that involved the alkyl condensation of the phenanthrene 9 carboxaldehyde with acetone as it was identified as one of the top hits for the docking site of Taxol. So basically, I needed to plan this reaction. First, first I went to Reaxis and performed a literature search and found no reported syntheses. There really, we could not find any reported syntheses of this compound in literature anywhere. So, we then began looking at what needs to be dissolved into the solvent. Well, the aldehyde needs to be soluble because that's reactant. The product, using the ONS web services, the product was actually predicted as having a really, really low solubility in all solvents. So obviously the model can still be improved. It is not um, because that, that can't, that's not necessarily true, which actually we definitely found wasn't true because I was able actually to take an NMR of the product using chloroform. So obviously some of it went into solution, but that's uh, another aspect. Um, sodium hydroxide needed to be used as a catalyst, so we needed a solvent that sodium hydroxide could be soluble in. So basically, you looked at the solubility of the aldehyde, um, phenanthrene 9 carboxaldehyde, and immediately you noticed that methanol is predicted as being soluble in it. And actually, I then went through and ran some experiments to determine that methanol actually was soluble in it. Um, and since sodium um, hydroxide is soluble in methanol, it was determined to attempt the synthesis <coughs> using the methanol. So I used methanol because it is hoped that everything would be dissolved in, but the product would come right out and we could just filter. So I went ahead and performed the synthesis, created a 0 0.016 molar solution of the aldehyde and methanol, added a large excess of the sodium hydroxide, and then stirred the mixture. And this is the reaction mixture, and it's kind of hard to see in this picture, but actually if you really hold it up close, you can see there's yellow crystals in the solution, um, which was perfect, because that's exactly what the goal is when performing a reaction like this, to have the product just come out so that you can just filter it. So I was able to go through and filter it and got some nice yellow, but that was a crude product that wasn't totally pure based on an NMR. So I, we went through and actually recrystallized it from benzene. Um, and as you can see, that was after the recrystallization, that top right picture, um, the crystals were forming, went ahead and filtered and got the nice yellow crystals and, <clears throat> at the, and then had a measured melting point of 264 to 250. 65 Celsius, um, and then went ahead and took the NMR, and from the NMR was able to characterize that the compound was indeed the compound that we desired to make. It had the 16 hertz trans coupling to show that it was the trans product that was obtained and not the cis. Um, one thing is there was a benzene peak in this um, spectrum, so I have to go through and dry it and take the NMR again. But um, So we were, was able, using the solubility tools, we were able to synthesize this compound. So um, just in quick summary, um, Open Notebook Science has really provided me a lot of advantages as an undergraduate student and different ways and things for, that I've been able to learn from it. Um, you, the solubility tools can be used to optimize recrystallizations, and the solubility tools can be used for planning um, different syntheses.
and there's some further information links. Um, thank you for your time, and are there any questions, I guess?